just stand with me tonight? We're just going to open up in prayer. Uh, why don't we just join together? If you see somebody across the aisle, why don't you just scoot in a little bit? Don't be afraid to join up with them in prayer. If you do so now, we can just go ahead and do that. Uh, we're going to just pray and ask the Lord to work in the service. If you, see, if you know there's a need in uh, someone's life next to you, why don't you just join with them right now? We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for this service, God. We thank you for this evening, God, that you've blessed us with. We thank you for waking us up this morning, for starting us on our way, for giving us, Lord, the breath of life. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you're going to do, all that you've already done, Jesus. We love you. We praise you, God, for you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. You do not fail. Oh, God, you do not change, Jesus. You are so good. You are merciful and just, God. Lord, you are good. I love you, Lord. True will endure to all generations. Lord, you are great and mighty. You are worthy to be praised, God. I ask that you would touch every need here tonight, every sickness, God, every pain, Lord, every situation, every trial, every circumstance, God. I pray that you would work in those situations tonight, God. Every need, Lord, God, that's been made known unto you, I pray that you begin to work, Lord. Move in every heart, move in every mind, God, and only the way that you can do, Lord. Less of us and more of you is what we need, Jesus. Less of our own ways, less of our own flesh, less of our own desires, God, and more of your spirit, Lord, more of your will, Lord, God. Less of what we want, Jesus. You would be lifted up, oh God. You would draw all men unto you, Jesus. We lift you up tonight, God. We love you. We praise you. Bless your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God is good. We thank you, Jesus. God is good. Tonight, we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to go ahead and kind of get some announcements out of the way. Uh, just to remind you, Friday night, the youth will be meeting at 7. 30. So all the youth will be meeting at 7.30. The young adults will be meeting at 7.30. They will also will be continuing their series called Iron Sharpening, some discussion on baptism and uh, the Holy Ghost. So you don't want to miss out, out on that if you're a young adult ages 18 to 30. God's been doing great things in those classes, young adult, youth classes, Sunday school. But sadly, only it's youth night and young adult night this Friday night. And then Sunday morning at 9.45, we'll have Sunday school. God is doing great things in our Sunday school classes. The rooms are getting filled up. So if you do not have a Sunday school class, make sure you go and find somebody that is a teacher. Brother Daniel and I, or Brother Michael uh, Lowe, Brother Mark Lowe. All of these guys are teachers, and they're doing phenomenal jobs. And Brother Moses, of course, with kids' ministry. And then Sunday evening, Sunday evening at 6 p.m., we will be right back here uh, for service. Sunday night, 5.30, pre-service prayer. So don't miss out on what God is doing for the rest of this week and going into the weekend. Um, be in prayer for this weekend services. God is going to do some great things. Now, I know we have some new invite cards out there. We have new invite cards, um, new guest cards, things like that. So stop by and grab a few of those uh, as you go out into the community. Uh, give those to your friends. Encourage someone. Invite someone. Tell them you'd love to see them at church. But do those through personal connections, right? Don't just go and lay them on every car and stuff. Actually get a, get a connection with somebody and pass that flyer, that invitation out to be most effective. But um, I just want to encourage you on those things right there. And tonight we're just going to sing a song of worship and praise unto the Lord. And then pastor's going to come and teach to us. So why don't we just go ahead and lift up our hands tonight and just thank God for the freedom that we have in him. Why don't we just thank him for the spirit? Why don't we just thank him for this presence? Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for your freedom, God, to worship you. We thank you for the freedom, the Lord, to praise you, to lift up your name, God, unashamedly. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you're doing, all that you're going to do, God, and all that you're done, you've done, Jesus. We worship you. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Praise the Lord. Maranatha. <laughs> that means Jesus is coming. That was a standard greeting in the New Testament, the first century church. Uh, I know we think it's praise the Lord, but it was really Maranatha. That was a common greeting. Now, uh, we do have, at the end of this service tonight, we're going to have a finance report business session because we have to do that every year. Sometimes it takes us too long to get it together, and it's not exactly the same time of the year all the time. Sometimes we have to postpone it a few days because of the schedule. Now, we've had all kinds of great things happen in the last few days around here. Man, last week was a full week, worshiping, preaching, teaching, Southwest Conference, visitors all over the place. And the last few Sundays, I guess the last three Sundays, we've had uh, a great crowd. We've had kids in the other building at the time we're having church here. We still fill the building up. Isn't that awesome? Fill the, fill the floor in both balconies for the last three Sundays and still had all the kids out of here. And so we can manage like that, can't we? We can manage. We, we can go on. The kids' ministry can grow. and We can deal with growth problems right now, but, you know, someday we'll have to do something else. We may have, like, as I said, buy the church down the street and have dual services. Or we might go somewhere else, buy something, buy a piece of property, move everything. It does cost a lot of work and a lot of money when you pick up everything and move. Lots of work. And uh, people have to be supportive with time and finance and give above their tithing. That's just what we have to do. But uh, thank God for growth. Thank God for people. It's in Bible studies. If you come into the church and you've been just baptized in Jesus' name, you just got the Holy Ghost, you need a Bible study so you can learn how to feed yourself. All right? The Word of God. You've got to be directed. First of all, they'll take you through the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You learn how to put it all together. Then you go back and you can really enjoy and get strength from what you read and study. Something else, you'll keep people from messing you up that think they're authorities also. They just know enough to mess you up. You don't know enough to keep them from messing you up. All right? So you can continue to grow in God and have the blessings of God upon your life. Now, uh, I want to uh, be mindful of the time here with what we've got to do tonight. Everybody, because it is a school night. And we do come here because this is a very important part of our life. It is important for your children to learn that regular attendance to church is more important than their getting up to catch the bus at 3 o'clock. you got to get that down. Uh, my parents never let me miss church because I had to get up and go to school the next day. We went to church. And so you can be deceived, and I'll show you that, probably a little bit of it tonight. You can be deceived by what they call success in the world may not, may not be success at all. And you need to teach your children. I'm going to tell you this. In Pentecostal churches right now, this is a shocking statement. Less than 75% of the young people live for God. So when we spend money on youth congress, youth meetings, you ought to be there. You ought to get your kids there. You ought to get your cousins, your nephews, and nieces there. And we ought to do everything we can to change that statistic. Uh, we got to get them involved in all kinds of spiritual things so they would get the spiritual grip of it and they wouldn't be lost. But it's really a sad day when you grow up in church much less a Christian school, or you had a Christian parent. Maybe if you didn't have both of them, you had one. You had a Christian parent that brought you to church, taught you the ways of God, and then when you got old enough, you left it. Well, that's one stupid person. That's all I can say. You went out to the world when you knew the blessings of God. You went to the Now, while you're standing, I'm going to tell all y'all. See, you young people haven't had a chance to see the ruined lives that come from that. And when they come back with a piece of an ear and a leg, they don't have enough to make a saint. Like the prophet Amos said, there wasn't enough left. All I found was an ear somewhere that the coyotes had left behind. 
I didn't have enough of the sheep to work with. Young people, you're going to see people your age that walk out on God. And when they walk out on God, the devil's going to destroy them. He don't play. And when they are done and he's through with them, he'll throw them by the wayside. A lot of times there's not enough left to even work with. So you better take heed today. You've been blessed to be raised by a Christian parent, by an apostolic mom, dad, or just one of the two. You are a privileged person. Now let's talk about some things today out of the Word of God. We we uh, do all kinds of things. It's high emotional. You know, we're high on the emotional ladder. We come to church. We shout, dance, praise God, and everybody thinks we're crazy and everything else. But there's a lot of deep things in God also. Just like there's high moments, there's deep moments. And things that we must consider, things that we must grow in. So tonight, I'm going to get into two general subjects primarily. I don't know how long I can take primarily. I'm going to get into two subjects. The first subject we're going to address tonight is vanity. Vanity. Now, most folk just know that as a place where the sink is in the restroom. <laughs> vanity. If they know that. Uh, but vanity is, in the Bible, is that's not the definition. And we're going to talk about vanity, and then we're going to try to talk about, in contradistinction to that, we're going to talk about what's wisdom. So let's read in the Psalm 24. Now, this is a beautiful psalm. It is uh, a psalm that has praise to it, <laughs> exaltation of God, but it has some lines in here that are contingent upon reaching God. We're going to get to those here in a moment. Now, when you read the book of Psalms, you're saying, this is mainly in my vertical relationship. The Psalms talk so much about praise and the right relationship with God. Then you get to the next book, Proverbs, and it talks about relationships horizontal with men, <laughs> mankind. You got Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Then in Ecclesiastes, you get into things that really uncover the introspect, the inward man. It's said that probably... The Song of Solomon was written in Solomon's younger years. But when you go like through Song of Solomon, you talk about Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, it looks like he's getting older and he has more to say that talks about wisdom. The older he gets. Song of Solomon, remember, is about the marriage and then uh, why would he talk about that? I wonder if he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And he, he's a young man, apparently. Now, he only ruled 40 years, by the way. That's God's probationary number. I guess that's all they'd let him go, 40 years. Let's, let's read Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. He's founded upon the seas, established it upon the floods, now, these two verses here, three and four, who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord, who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Let's get that one line there again. If he's not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. All right, that's the criteria. You've got to have this to ascend to the great things of God. The blessings, the magnitude of God, you've got to have these things. All right? Now let's do something else. Let's read out of Ecclesiastes. Actually, this word, Ecclesiastes, if you look in uh, some Bibles, it says the preacher. Well, I guess Solomon went from being a lover to a preacher. All right. <laughs> now, in 
seventh chapter of Ecclesiastes. Let's just read the last verse. That's verse 29. Let's see what it says. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Now, that's a very sober statement right there. God made man upright, but he sought out many inventions. Now, taking this from the man that wrote it, I would have to say one of his inventions must have been an improvement, he thought, on God's plan for marriage, which was one man and one woman, because he had all those women folk in his household. So he had changed the intention of God by many inventions just in that area alone. And I'm sure he had pierced his heart through with many sorrows. And in his youth, he probably thought, man, this is the best thing imaginable. But then it came home, didn't it? It came home. Lord, help us to receive your word tonight, to understand, to perceive and gain wisdom from your word that we would not fool ourselves in this hour when there's so many things, so many inventions, so many inventions to fool us. God help us, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Well, I'm glad you're here. You may be seated. You say the word vanity. What do we mean? Someone is vain or they are taken with vanity. Well, they're conceited usually, right? Conceited, they're into their own self. They're lifted up in their own pride. And they are inflated. And they are self-exalting. They are very considerate of their self-image. They are sometimes possessed with their self-image and their appearance. A vain person can go beyond just the idea of what do people think about me till they modify what people think about them and they don't just modify or try to fool you with behavior, but so many folks are concerned about their looks and uh, you see them, they go from, well, the vitamin store to the fitness center, right. then they go to the plastic surgeon then they become really enamored. They want to change their sex, transgender ideology. See, that's van all those are vanities. That's vanity, all right? So if we understand what vanity is, maybe I can go a little bit further. But self-image, impatience, and uh, every time we read in these words like Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, these are books that are called books of wisdom. And we read things from men that's been through it, like Job had lost everything. But he could tell you it was worth waiting on the Lord when it was all over. He had more than he ever had, twice what he ever had. I don't know whatever happened to his wife, but uh, children, houses, land, everything. He was increased of God. He wouldn't curse God for all the calamity that came in his life. He was patient. He never was lifted up in vanity, and he never took it out on the Lord for what happened to him. Now, Job was a righteous man. He was a righteous man, as we've read. Man is made basically upright, but he is destroyed by many inventions. Now, uh, have you noticed how Islam hates America? And you say, why do they hate me? You might wonder, why does a Muslim hate me? Let me ask yourself, why does a Muslim hate me? Well, it's not really you that individually they hate. It's what America has done to the rest of the world. And all America hasn't done it, but there's a few folk that's got the money and the influence with inventions they've done it. One of the most destructive inventions in the morality of America and its influence on the world to cause even the Muslim people 
Even though they want to live here, they call us what? Anybody know what they call us? What? They call us the devil. They call us the great Satan. Now, for Israel, they, you know, but we're the great Satan. Well, because we have deceived so many with our devices and our inventions. That's why. Well, why would, why would they think that? Is it because we are very influential when it comes to mobility and the cars and the high-tech devices and the iPhones? And Is that it? Not really. I'll tell you what one of the major forces is that's caused the demise of the world and causes us to be accused. It's those people that live in Hollywood, California. Not all the residents of Hollywood, you understand. I, I have cousins that just victims. They live there. It's where they work. But uh, they could do better, I guess. But they make money there. They've become quite wealthy. They drive around. They pick which of their 50 cars are going to drive. They get two a day, you know. And they drive down in their Bentley or whatever it is down the freeways and wave at all the movie stars and whatever it is. But they're not in the movie business that I know of, but they have made lots of money with other supportive industries. But what is it? What is it about this place? Well, it's what they produce. It's all the stuff that's gone from what we used to think was violence, you know, somebody shooting a cowboy, somebody falling off a stagecoach. That was, we thought that was a little vile, but, boy, it's ever different now, isn't it? The old black and white movies, I don't know if when they started calling us the great Satan, but they do call us the great Satan now. Most of that is because that lifestyle that's presented through the medium of television has warped the minds and expectations of so many people. And even though they practice a lot of things that's uh, totally adverse to true morality, like a multitude of wives... Children for wives, incest, and all kinds of things, they still want to blame us for being Satan. That is mainly because of television. Now, if you have television, I wish you would wake up. If you set your kids down in front of television, you say, Well, I have a cable and I use it for internet. If you do, you better make sure and monitor it because if you don't, you're going to be placing some really bad influencing inventions in front of your kids. And uh, you say, well, let's, let's talk about Jesus. I am. If you want to know Jesus in his power and his pure moral nature, his holiness, you've got to have clean hands and a pure heart, people. You're not going to grow in God if you keep taking in, you know, the sewage of the world. Your spiritual diet is not going to mix with that sewage plant you're feeding right into your house from Hollywood. And you got all of that that now has fashioned us into a society of very immoral people, but yet we can still say we trust in God. And we can pride ourselves that the policemen have it on their car, and God we trust. Where really we trust our idols, and we don't trust God. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm telling you the truth. And so most places in the Bible when you say vanity, it is synonymous with the word idolatry. It's not just some practice that interrupts my walk with God, but it usually comes to dominate your walk with God. I will tell you here and now, I've seen it all these years when I grew up as a young man, people on the periphery of the church that had television, they watched it, their kids didn't serve God. Boy, you're saying, man, he's totally out of the ballpark tonight. Where is he? I'm talking to you. That's where I am. And so I remember when my wife and I were laughing about this before church, and I said, I can't remember these guys' names. I think their name was Romero. They, they, I think they put on this cowboy act. And then she said, oh, there was two boys named Funk, Terry Funk, and something because – you know, she's grown up in the world. She remembers all the big-time wrestlers. Well, I don't know them all, but I remember some. I thought they were cowboys from Texas, but I kind of found out they wasn't. I think they were from Albuquerque somewhere. 
So these guys, Romero guys, you know, they come to town and, well, they get a crowd over here at the Coliseum like you wouldn't believe. There'll be thousands of people out there. I think they did that. They used to do that on Tuesday night, but, you know, that form of entertainment, I guess we outgrew that. But do they still do big-time wrestling? I don't know. Do they do that? Anybody know? Anybody want to confess that you've seen it? <laughs> and everybody's smiling, but ain't nobody saying yes. So they had the big-time wrestling, and, boy, we, the, the, the crazier, the wilder it was, the more people were stirred up, you know. And if they threw them out, out of the ropes, out in the ring, and people got hitting on them, then they didn't know how to fake it. They just really hitting them. So if you punched the guy out, faked him out, put him out of the ring, everybody outside the ring is mad, and they're going to be really hitting the guy. I wouldn't want to be that guy and get thrown out of the ring, you know, as part of the sideshow. I wouldn't want to be there because it's going to hurt when you're done, all right? Like one guy said, he said, man, I was so scratched up. I was tore up. I didn't get tore up in the ring because I we had all the moves. It was chore choreography to its highest degree, right? Well, when I went out of the ring, it was another story. Them, them, them girls, them old men weren't playing. They were hitting me, all right? They were, they were really getting mad. They were doing the real thing. And uh, <laughs> so we've had, you know, just to think something like that. Well, that seems to have come and gone. But all, all the old people, I remember one guy that could never live for the Lord. He, he would get fired up about the time we'd have a real big evangelist. I mean, big time evangelist. And he liked, he liked the notoriety. So every time we'd have a real, I mean, somebody real famous, an evangelist, he would want to take them out to eat and pay for their motel. He would become very spiritual all of a sudden. And then when it was over, you know, you go to his house, he'd be down in front of that television. You couldn't get him to praise God if your life depended on it. But boy, when big time wrestling was on, I mean, he'd be on the floor. Get him, stupid, kill him. You know, I mean, he could get into it. I mean, and people could get into such things and not realize. I wish I had a picture of you. You're 50 years old and you're acting like a total child out of control. You're into this thing. You're so wrapped up in this thing, you don't even realize how crazy you look. And people do that. They even do that about all kinds of entertainment things, sports, whatever. They do it, and they're enamored by it, and they're totally, totally oblivious to what life is really about. But they live in a state of vanity. I see people, I see people like that years down the road. I'm, I want to ask you, so what did you gain from that? You spend all them hours every week. You spend all that money going to big time wrestling. What'd you get for it? Not one thing. Not one thing. Well, you paid them the money, and some of them live in nice houses in Hawaii or wherever. They they live a high lifestyle. And what you get? You got nothing. But you paid because you wanted to be entertained. Uh, that's what vanity is. It's entertaining. And uh, I, I see people. I see people that's so. So worried about how people feel about them, what they think of them, that they become ensnared by other people's opinion. Really, and the people don't even give them the, they don't give them the thought. They don't think, well, you're ugly or good. They don't even think about you. You don't cross their mind, but you think that you do. And so I see people that get lifted up in such vanity. I, I, it starts kind of disturbing me. I saw somebody here at this youth conference, and while people that I figure to be righteous, living the life, they're watching, but this person was really motivated, and they were up here, and they were putting the iron claw on people, almost reminded me of the wrestling deal, and they were really into it, and I'm looking at them, and they got this quite exotic looking hand. I'm looking on the top of this person's being prayed for, and I'm saying, wow, I'm talking like gold glitter on one, red on another. Got all these different jobs of paint on their hands, and I'm thinking, you know, that's really strange to me uh, when you come to the house of God and somebody has been so vain that they got to do this to make their self feel like they have value, and now they're, they're, but what I was really weirded out with, the important expression is, they're up here praying for people and people that ought to be praying with people ought to have the power and ought to have freedom to flow in the spirit. They're sitting there watching. Like nothing's, like who's that? 
Well, I'll tell you who that is. That somebody's going to take your place that's going to steal the power out of the church and going to steal your opportunity because you don't know why you live like you live and why we do what we do. We do that so we can appeal to God, so we can ascend to God's power and ascend to God's presence, and then we can exercise it. All right, y'all, y'all, maybe y'all get here after a while. Okay. Now, so vanity, vanity will come and steal your heart, steal your walk with God. It will steal your power with God. And these inventions will come, and you'll not even know that you have decayed so much. Man was made upright, but because of inventions, he has crumbled. He has crumbled in his power, his relationship with God, his morality. And now we are waiting on God to do something that he's waiting on a vessel to work through. Now, okay, since we're called the great Satan and we fit into this and they call all Americans the great Satan, I want to make, I want to make it well known here. God, don't hold what Hollywood does against me. Don't hold what that bunch of idiots in Washington does against me. I want you, God, have mercy on me. I don't want the wrath of God because of the way. Now, all right, let me just tell you, the, the reason we have what we have in Washington is because the people put them there. They're a manifestation of the thoughts of the people. That's why you better vote. You better vote something that's as close as you can get to what's right. If it's not the whole full-blown deal, do as good as you can. Okay, now here's what you can do. Kind of like some of these politicians. Now, here's what I would do if I was some of them. You know, people say, well, I know you. You don't live right. Maybe you can say that about Donald Trump. Right? Well, when they tell you that, well, yeah, I know you. I know what you used to be. All Donald Trump's got to say is, well, that was when I was a Democrat. <laughs> so, so, hey, you switch. Maybe you don't live like you used to live. But actually, all we got to say is, that's before I met Jesus. Okay? Get you off my back. Now, I, I used to, now, sure, I used to tell lies. Okay? Now, now who, who doesn't believe Donald wasn't a womanizer? Sure he was. But I don't know what he's doing right now. Something's pretty strange happening to this dude if he's selling Bibles. That's all I can say. And he says he's going to church every week. He never did that before. Now, I know there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to become to, to change from one status to another. But, you know, when, you, when, when God starts working in you and word starts going into your life, things will change. Things will change. As you've heard me say many times, you don't read the Bible without it reading you. If you start saying, I'm going to read the Bible every day, something's going to happen to you because it's going to get in your spirit because it is spirit and it is life. If it gets in you, things you start saying, woe is me, I'm an unclean man. Woe is me, I've done wrong. Woe is me. You're going to start self-examining. The Word of God will examine you. It's like a two-edged sword, remember? It's sharp on both sides. It will examine you. And you don't handle it without something happening to you. And so when you start looking into the Word of God, things start changing in your life. If you really read the Word of God, if you go to any kind of church and the Word of God is read, if you take it to heart, many people take it seriously. They take it to heart and they go out and they try to live a better moral life. Well, sure they do. But let me tell you something. You know what the difference is between you and a lot of them? The Spirit. It's that simple. I take the Word of God, but it's not just by word only, but it's by word and Spirit. And so I got the Spirit of God to help me. I wish, I wish some of the folk that struggle, they read the Bible, and then they can go out and cuss the next day, cuss the next minute, curse whatever. I wish they had the Spirit to help them. You've got the Spirit in your life. You've got the Word in your life. There's no reason you should fall to all the prey of the devil, all the inventions and all the f- of the devil. All right? You shouldn't fall to all the inventions of the devil. You should be able to walk upright and live righteous before the Lord because you got help. See, the Spirit helps our infirmities, the things that's wrong inside of us. When we don't even know how to pray, like one man said, he said, Lord, I hope you hear my words and don't take it from my heart because my heart's messed up. 
But Lord, I do want to do what's right. I want to obey your word. Lord, I do want to be saved. Even though my heart and my emotions are doing otherwise, Lord, I got to be saved. Would you take me and take my words, Lord? I do want, hey, the Lord take you to your word. He'll pull you out of the mess you're in eventually. It may take a while, but he'll get you out. He will get you out. Yeah. We'll turn the book of Isaiah here a moment. In the book of Isaiah, I think I'm in five. We'll see if we're not. We'll fix it, I guess, when we get there. Right? In Isaiah 5, and uh, see if I marked this. Yeah, yeah, I did. Okay. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity. All right, now, woe unto them that are ensnared, okay? Woe unto them that are ensnared to re- The word iniquity is rebellion against what you know is right, okay? Sin, but iniqu- the devil said he was lifted up and, his, and iniquity was found in him. That's why the Lord cast him down. He knew that was wrong, but he did it anyway. That's iniquity. All right, said so. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with a rope to pull a wagon. All right, now, let me just do this for a few minutes. Maybe I can let you go after this. I don't know. All right, so you think when you start living after the enticement of sin, okay, you didn't think nothing would happen when you first Went and looked in the mirror and said, I'm looking too old and you want to look young. And so you want to paint yourself up rosy red. You look a little funny. look like some, uh, somebody at the, the clubs, right? You didn't think much about that. Thought, I sure look, I see what my husband says, if you're married or whatever. Okay. So you didn't think much about it. But uh, then after that, then you got to take it a little further. Well, I, I need to be a little bit more penis. So I'll go get me some, is that Botox? I got to be careful. Make sure to put the O in there. Botox. All right, so now, now it, that's not enough, so I go to the next level, so I got to go get some Botox. I don't even want to know how much that stuff costs, but so you got to get your lips, and if you want a fat lip, I can give you a cheap fat lip, <laughs> but uh, they, they go and they, they get these big, you know, you got to have these lips, it's like three times, and you look at it, whoa, what happened to you? And you don't want to ask because you know what happened? Botox. So they got to have these big old lips. Now, I, I, please don't explain it to me now, but what's this big deal with having these humongous lips? Okay? Uh, it's not the race that you are. Come on now. I'm going to talk to you. Why, why to, to go and get Botox, if you're brown, black, white, whatever it is, what is this thing about? Okay? What is it? You're going to go get these... Then, Botox is enough, so, so now i got to have some barn red paint or some black. i got to enhance the work I've done that cost me so much money. Have you figured this out? You're a pretty vain person. Oh, I'm just trying to, well, uh, I'm trying to be, okay, that's what you call vanity. Okay, now, I think we're just about where I've defined what vanity is right now, right? Okay, so I start out, this is why I went to this verse of scripture, it says, you, you start out, and you're drawn with cords, and you think nothing's really ensnaring you. It looks like a little spider web. When the first urge to rebel or the first urge of temptation comes, it looks like a spider web. It couldn't catch you if it had to. You can just bat it out of the way. All right, but it gets worse. You see, it says that draw with cords, the word cords there, Actually, is when they try to the commentators try to describe this verse. It's not it's not easy. They say this is like something so minuscule. It's like a spider web. So you think, uh, I you know I can deal with this. A spider web's nothing. I can brush it off. But then the further you go, the spider web has the strength of a rope that would pull an ox cart. Okay. I thought it was so immaterial and so unimportant until it snared me. It didn't just snare my self-image. And they use the word self-esteem a lot, which is very dangerous. It didn't just snare me. 
my opinion that others have of me and now how I feel about myself is so ruptured and it's so, so broken that now everything I am is not fitting for nothing. I, I'm ugly. I, there's something wrong with everything about me. That is, God said I made you upright. I made you the way I wanted you. And you're not going to find satisfaction. I'm sorry. You might find a temporary lift, but you're not going to find completion by trying to change the way God made you. Vain. We got to tuck this, tuck that. And, well, I don't know. I better shut up. Okay. We have augmentation here and there. What is all this about? It's because we have become so vain. It's not just what we do with our temple, but this carries over into our self image and what people think of us. And I catch myself, why am I making this decision? Is it because I want somebody else to like it? Or do I want God to like it? Uh-oh. Okay, why do I need this? Okay, if you've got five new cars in the driveway, you can drive one at a time. Okay, you're a car collector, all right? You're going to sell them and make money. I get it. I, I've worked on people's houses. I had 40 cars. I had to build a house addition to a guy's house one time in Rio Dos Cloudcroft area when I lived there. He had cars and had no place to put them, all kinds of stuff, you know, collectibles. And, uh, okay, you collect cars, all right. But see, a lot of folk, they do this because it helps them feel better or it makes them think other people respect them more or they feel like uh, I am showing that I am more capable, that I am a viable force in Odessa if I, okay. No, 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 no. I wish we could think differently. All right, so am I going to spend my money on things that make me look good? Or can I say, Lord, why am I doing this? Anyway, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to the kingdom that he told his kids to try to pray for. When he said, when you pray, here's how you pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I'm not going to pray like, Lord, you know I need a Mercedes Benz. All my friends drive Porsches. And I got to make amends. I got to be different. Is it because you're trying to be different? You're trying to be established? You're trying to be noticed? What is it? Okay. I wish we would try to get the attention of God and try to do things for the kingdom as half as much as we want to do things to please people who don't care nothing about us. Boy, that would be something, wouldn't it? So, uh, you know, you try to keep up with people who don't care nothing about you. Spend money you don't have on the credit, and then you end up putting yourself in a bind. You can't be comfortable to do what you really know you have to do. So, ever, you know, if I'm going to spend some amount of money, you know what I ask myself before I ever do? I don't even tell my why. I'm saying, why am I doing this? Why am I doing it? Why am I doing it? Is there any kind of self-exaltation or vanity in any decision I make? Okay, some of y'all want to be used in me. Okay, I got one for you. Why do you want to sing up here? Why do you want to play? Why do you want a new dress? Why do you want anything? Is it because of vanity? Or can you say be patient and wait until God would send something your way and you know it was God? And then you would know it was right. And then watch how happy you are. Watch how fulfilled you are, huh? Just see the difference. See the difference. Okay, so, whoa. Man, I, I better watch out here. I might get on some toes here. You better put your feet under the seat, all right? Okay. Let's go back a little bit. Psalms. Now, let's go to Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13, all right? I haven't even got over out of the word and really defining the word vanity yet, but maybe I'll at least get over what wisdom is here in a second. Okay. Okay, now, let's go. Uh, now, I realize we're in a society where inflation is ripping us off. I know you hear all them quacks on the news say we're doing better than we've ever done. That ain't right. You know that ain't right. Your money's not stretching to the end of the month, so you know that ain't right. They're trying to make you feel good about yourself, but they they flying in jets and trying to make you drive an electric car. I know how that works. They, see, they're trying to convince you so you'll vote for them. That's all. That's all a bunch of lies. Now, 
we're struggling. We're in a day when we used to say, it used to be common knowledge, that the next generation would have more than the previous. All right, think back on where you've come from. I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. But my brother and I grew up in a house with no heat in it, really. And in the winter, we had ice on the inside of the windows. Finally, we, you know, we had a gas heater. Couldn't afford to have a floor heater in the thing. It cost too much money. We had a gas heater in there where we ate our Pop-Tarts before school in the morning. We'd go in there and hug that heater. We'd sit right on it stay warm. And uh, all these amenities that we think we have to have, we didn't have. All right? We just made it. We didn't know any better. We, I guess we thought everybody else was just like us. We just didn't have much. But thank God it's not like that now. You know, there may be things my wife, kids don't like. Maybe I haven't given them everything. But I think we're doing pretty good right now. We don't walk anywhere unless we want to. We don't get cold in the winter. We don't get hot in the summer. We can crank that air down to cold as you want. We can crank the heat up in the winter. We can enjoy it. We don't even have to haul the wood in. We can just turn the thermostat. We're pretty blessed, I think. But, you know, this generation is, uh, this is an unusual, this is an unusual turn in society. We used to all, it was growing and everybody would have more uh, than the previous generation. But now, we've come to a generation that don't know how to work. They want to depend on somebody else for everything. And they become very vain and they think, well, it's the word we call entitlement. You owe it to me. Grandpa made it, and I'm going to spend it. So, in a step of three generations now, where are we at? We got kids. Like the guy said, they're so poor they can't pay attention. They don't have nothing and don't plan on getting anything. You know what's so dreadful about that? That's prime target for the Antichrist and Socialism. Marxism, communism, socialism, that thrives in that kind of foolishness because people are not driven to become and have and own and secure and save, those sort of things. So th this is, hey, guys, you better be aware. You ought to thank God, pastor, would talk to you about some of these things. You better be thanking God we're in a church that we try to order our life, plan our life, put God's kingdom first, put our 10% in and then try to support because God's blessing comes back when we give to the kingdom of God. Always does. All right. Well, let's look in Proverbs 13 and see what it says here, all right? Okay. Wow. Wealth gotten by, uh-oh, there's that word again. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Okay, when you don't know the cost of things, it's easy to let somebody come along and hornswoggle you. That's Greek for they're going to rip you off. All right? They're going to come and rip you off. And, oh, it don't matter. It's just money. Somebody that works for it's not going to let that happen. That's why in the process of time, you may start it out at the bottom of the scale, but you work your way up in trust. You begin to earn more, then you get leadership qualities, then you get opportunities for business, then you make it. But see, people has never done that. I've seen, I don't know who I was talking to the other day about, but I said, everybody I've ever seen that ever got, got large sums of money given to them didn't do well. Uh, I, I can call to mind, when I was a young man, there was a, a fellow, a friend of ours, his son had an oil foot accident, was severely burned, he uh, not just was burned, and he had a lawsuit about being burned, but when they were moving him from one hospital to the burn facility, the ambulance company dumped him off on the ground. So he had another big lawsuit. Then he had all this money, and I would say probably most of you young men could guess what he went and bought first. Anybody, anybody under the age of 30 want to guess? Talk to me. You said what? A car. a car. No, he didn't just buy a car. He bought more than one, and he had to buy him hot rods, you know, like the road runners with the fins on the back. Y'all don't remember those, do you? The Barracudas, the Mustangs, the 5 O's, whatever. Got, I, you know, I got to have two or three of them, right? 
because that's what I've always wanted. Now without work, well, pain, but without work, I've got all this. Now, you know what? That is a depreciating piece of junk, metal. Five years, it's not going to be worth nothing because it's going to be tore up, wore out, depreciated. But most people that have not got by hard labor, you know what? It's easy for you to give it away on things that don't last. I need to come slap some, give some of y'all a fat lip without Botox. You know what? You spend money on things that pass away. You spend money on things that depreciate, and they don't help you in your life and your family down the road, and you can't be a blessing to others in the kingdom of God because you're so vain. So now, money that's given to you is one thing, but money that's gained by vanity, by doing what's wrong. So you're probably going to ask me the question. Let me answer it right now. So what if uh, I play the lottery and I win that $1 billion lottery? Okay, well, some of y'all don't know that first of all, if you win a billion dollars, about 700000 okay, times 10, which is going to be about $70 million, okay, you're going to have gambling tax when you win something in a drawing or on a lottery, is 30-something percent, okay? Then you're going to have your income tax to pay after that, all right? So what are you going to do now? So you told your friends and your little doping buddies that you'd half it with them, you've already lost everything because they're going to come kill you if you don't give them half, all right? So you got your half, and then you 30 40 percent in gambling taxes and other taxes, you're not going to have anything left, are you? So what happens to people that get money by vanity and by vain things? What happens to that? They don't last. Usually people that become multimillionaires overnight become multipaupers within five years. You can check all that. You've got information. You can Google that if you want. But usually people that win lotteries don't know how to invest. They don't know how to keep people from horn swoggling them. Okay, so they, they don't have anything left to show for it. Well, what would you do, Pastor? If, uh, if I won a billion dollars, it's like somebody come over here the other day, said I got a lawsuit going on, and they had beer on their breath. I could smell the alcohol. Oh, I don't drink. I'm going to tell you, lying dog. Man, I can smell it on you right now. I don't drink. I said, you know what? You got to stay off the bottle. You got to keep your head on straight. At that time, they smell like alcohol. And why is it people think I'm going to be getting all this big bunch of money? They get so vain. And the lawyers get so vain. Where's Brother Dennis? He's not here, is he? Okay, he, he has, he's, he's quite good at what he does. He's a good lawyer. Okay, does a lot of municipality things. But this, friends, I know when they get. Money, well, the lawyer is so sure that he's going to get the case and win millions himself. You know, they usually get that 30%. They, they clean house 40%, 50% on whatever they get. So they're willing. They'll buy you a new convertible. They do. And they'll buy you whatever you want. And you can even quit your job if you've got a big lawsuit coming up because you know you're going to get some money. And you know what the lawyer will do? He'll pay you what you was making on your job because he knows he's going to get paid. Amazing, isn't it? And so that's money that maybe took pain or somebody else's pain, but it was vain the way you got it. And so, well, what if, what if somebody comes and I won't give 20% to the church? You know what I'd say? Give it here. The devil's had it long enough. I'd also say this. You need some help. You need a financial advisor that takes your money. You can't get your hands on it, but a little bit at a time. So you quit trying to impress people and waste money. I told him, I said, do you have a financial friend, an advisor? Nothing to me, but I know an old guy that I went to school with that could help you make more money off your money than you'd make from your original settlement. 
See, people don't, no, I can't do that. I'm going to spend it all. When you get large sums of money, which I've never had a large sum of money, whatever I had, I worked for, sold real estate or whatever, and I usually put it back in real estate. You don't take money out of real estate and go buy a car. No, a thousand times no. Put it back in real estate or give it to the church or something. Yeah, okay. But you're going to take money that was hard labor to get it, and then you're going to go turn it into vain money? Oh, no, you should never do that. All right, so vanity, and you say, oh, I get a chance now. I'm going to have all this. See, folks that are impatient, they let instant money ruin them when you could take big sums of money tied up in other things that would be investments. You could live a, a long time on that amount of money and never run out, or it could even multiply itself over and over again. Now, it used to be that way with just interest, compounded interest, but you can't compound interest today on this little measly 2%. One point whatever percent, you can't make nothing on a million dollars. But if you had a million dollars, you know, you could make a hundred thousand a year off a million dollars in the bank. And if you let it grow and you don't spend a hundred thousand, next time you're going to have more than a hundred thousand. Now you won't get ten thousand because you don't make anything on your interest. But see, people that's never had to manage their money, they don't care. If they get a large sum of money, what do they care? Well, I got this. didn't cost me nothing. See, you got that by vanity. It didn't cost you hard labor. And so now, isn't that strange? I'm having a business meeting tonight when we follow this. All right? So you wasted all that. Now, when you come to the end of your life when you should be blessing, now you don't have anything. This generation that we're, we're seeing right now has not a whole lot of hope in surviving any kind of calamity in the world. They don't know how to preserve food. They don't know how to live off the land. They don't know how to control their self when it gets, like them guys told me, them people coming up out of the jungles of South America, they'll go to New York if they shut the grocery stores down, they clean them out, them guys will start eating the people. They're cannibals. They're going to eat because they've lived off the land and off the people. Yeah. But see, we don't know how to do that. So first thing we do, we are, we are deceived by those cords that were nothing more than spider webs. We go, oh, there's nothing wrong with having this paradigm or this philosophy in life for my kids. No, your kids need to be taught to trust God, work hard, be honest, and let God bless them. You do what's right, and you'll make it. And quit buying them scratch-off cards. I see crazy old people. Every time I go in H-E-B, crazy old people up there buying out them machines, buying them cars. And I'm thinking, look at this kid, dirty diapers. What are you doing? What did you see? But then they get to thinking they're so vain. They think that kid can suffer and have a diaper rash and stink and poop all over himself. And here I am. I think I'm going to get rich. And you never get rich. And the kid grows up in poverty. He becomes a gangster. He becomes a drug addict. And he becomes a burden to the prison system because you had a weird mentality that you're going to get something an easy way. You don't get anything easy. If you want it, you've got to work for it. And you've got to tell your kids that and quit deceiving them. They've got to learn how to work. And you don't gain by vanity, but what you lose through vanity. Vanity will cause you to lose things. Oh, yeah. Well, I better hurry. What time is it? Give me just another five Give me just a few minutes, would you please? All right. Okay. How can I, how can I instill in my family how to manage and be patient? Okay, now I, I skipped over it. I said, I'm not going to read that. Tonight. I'm going to give you a All right, because if you don't live for God, if you don't live for God and you have godly parents, if my kids wasn't living for God, what little I have, I wouldn't give it to them. You're mean. No, I'm going to be upright and I'm not going to make an idiot out of them. I'm not going to be supportive of their sinful behavior. All right? You got the message? If you want to do what's right, kids ought to learn to live right or what you've worked so hard for and you want it to be multiplied 
and you want to be smart with it, you know what I'd do? I'd give it all to the church. That's what I'd do. I've given most everything we've ever had come our way in life. I give it back to the church. My kids will learn to do the same thing. As a matter of fact, somebody gives me a little bit of cash or something, you know what I immediately go do? I put it in the offering envelope and I put my tithing and then I put as much in the offering as I put in the tithing. If I put $100 in tithing, I put $100 in the offering. Then I end up spending all the rest of it. I thought I was going to spend it on me. I give it to all the church kids working at the farm or buying their dinner. Or something else. But I can tell you this right here. I've never seen the righteous forsaken like the man David said. Nor a seed begging bread. I ain't never been hungry. I had never been hurting. When I was sick and I couldn't get well, my doctor came to see me. His name is Jesus. When I put him first, I'm, I'm high on his list too, you know. But when he's low on your list and you're full of vanity, he don't have to do anything for you. But if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else will be added to you. This does pay to live for God. You can make it with less and have more in God's kingdom. If you'll say, Lord, not my will, but thy will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Lord, I want to, I want to, every decision I make, I want it kingdom effective. Kingdom effective. Yeah. When you get in the book of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, you get into all kinds of things that are so direct, it's almost like, how could anybody do this? All right. Well, we know what a proverb is. A proverb is a short line from a long life. It's like, would you like to hear a 19-year-old come up here and tell you about life? You probably wouldn't listen to it too much because he hadn't been through too much, but I have. And uh, there's a couple men in here older than me, I think in their 80s, and uh, they could tell you some of the same things. If you'll wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, you'll find, you say, well, I really want to do something. Wait on the Lord, ask God to help you, ask counsel, get people to help you that know what they're doing. You'll always uh, run less of a risk of failure. You'll have success in your life. Okay, so we know what Proverbs are somewhat. Uh, like, you know, you can't row the boat and rock the boat at the same time. You have people that come in here and all they want to do is rock the boat. Uh, if you're rowing, you don't have time to fuss and fight inside the boat. We have people, all they want to do is criticize. But you can't ever get them to work on nothing. People that's working, they're not time, their time's not spent criticizing. Their time is spent in productive things, right? Now, sometimes you think, well, the Word of God is so mundane and what God is saying is, you know, it's really out of touch. There's one about the barn. There's one in, in the scripture about where no oxen are, the crib is clean. Well, you say, that's kind of dumb. Well, in other words, if you're really doing something on a farm, you're going to have manure to, to show. Right. Right. There's, there's bad things that come with prosperity. There's the things of daily life that come with just putting up with the world, Right? And so now, the practical instruction of the Lord's word, if you will follow it, will cause you to be prosperous and save you much shame and much heartache. You'll save yourself heartache. Now, I see people that could do better, but they never ask anybody spiritual about anything. They want to ask all their peers. That's like Solomon. I'll try to wrap it up here, like Solomon. Uh, Solomon, uh, things start turning in his kingdom. He has a high tax role. He has to collect a lot of taxes to keep up his majesty. And so uh, when Solomon decays and he's gone, his son goes to all of his peers, asks him what to do. And uh, they say, you know, Come on, man, you got to be tough. So instead of lowering the taxes, he's going to heap more burden on them. Well, how do you think that works with a young man when he don't have any wisdom? His dad was the wisest man in the world. Here he says, uh, all right, you're going to have to pay more taxes, work harder. We're going to take more of your check. 
Is that going to go over? No, it's not going to go over. But he would not listen to counsel. He listened to young men that were caught up in the whole thing of being vain. They all wanted to drive a new chariot too, you know. So let's raise the taxes so we all get new chariots. Sounds like the District of Columbia. That's in Washington, D.C., District of Columbia. Okay, so everybody wants to reap the benefits of being appointed to a public office. And uh, we've heard a lot said about, well, Trump is vulnerable because he needs money. He got more money than all y'all. You're not vulnerable? If you say you need money? You're lying and stealing. You got your boy lying and stealing to get money from China? Sound like you're the one that's vulnerable. Well, somebody that needs money is, okay, I'm, I'm about to wind it up. Solomon's son was in that situation where the common opinion of all these young men was worldly. It wasn't spiritual at all. So when he takes the kingdom, he inherits something that subdued the surrounding world. Subdued it, had shipping, had all kinds of novelties, all kinds of gold and all their buildings. And they were a sight to behold. But when the young man took it, he had no discretion. He was very vain. He's going to continue a lifestyle of vanity, but he didn't do anything to gain it. And just in one generation, you see what happens? David fought to gain control of the Mideast. He subdued, he gathered materials, he put under subjugation the rock quarries, the forest of great cedar. He brought all that to pass, but when Solomon came, all he had to do is basically run the kingdom, built the buildings, spent the money. But now his son comes along he has no clue of what it cost. The lives that were lost, the fighting men that David had, the loyalty, the suffering they endured to become the kingdom that they were. They didn't know about it. It was so easy that they gave up so easy. Jeroboam, Rehoboam, the kingdom divided. Now what are they doing? Guess what? These cords that were nothing more than spider webs have now become large ropes tethered to their sin and to their idolatry. They adopted now all the ladies. All the ladies has come from foreign lands. Now David's gone, Solomon's gone. Now they've brought in all their false gods and they've rejected Jehovah God for a handmade God to be like everybody else, to fit in with society, and now their vanity has turned from just a little weak web to a very strong rope, and their vanity has bound them. And next we know, Israel was divided from Judah. The kingdom is divided, and now what happens? They become so weak they can't defend themselves. What was their weakness predicated on? They lost their walk with God. They thought vanity would fu fulfill their spiritual needs, and there was nothing there. When the enemy came, there was no defense against it. The Assyrians came and took the northern kingdom. Then Babylon came and took both kingdoms. And they were hopeless and helpless. What for? Because just being vain... led to destruction. It led to destruction. You say, am I being vain to do this? Well, look at yourself. Look at the Word of God. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I doing this so that people will like me? Am I doing this to please people? Okay, there's two sides to this. Pleasing people as in what? Worldly people or people that are godly? If people that are godly make a decision and they see that it's all right, you're pleasing godly people, 
you're probably going to be safe. But you don't do things just to please all the people. You've got to ask the question. I'm going to have to answer for me. Turn inside. Intrinsic examination and say, how am I going to do with this if I lose everything now? How am I going to make it? Okay. So here's what you do. What will happen if I lose all this? What will happen if I make the wrong decision? What will happen if this decision comes back to get me. You're going to have to live with yourself. you got to live with yourself. See, when you do things in yourself, denying and under God, say, Lord, I'll be like Job. If you kill me, I'm still going to trust you. I do what I do unto God, not because it's something I really want for me, but because I know in the end this is what God wants for me. Not what I want for myself, but what God wants for me. It's kind of hard to think like God because we're fallen creatures. But God don't look at your ugliness as a strike against you, thank God. I'd have never got anywhere. He don't look at your poverty as a strike against you. Everybody's on equal ground at the cross, people. When you come to Calvary, everybody's on the same level ground. There's no rich, no poor, no bond, no free. When we come to Jesus, we come as a soul with what we have in the eternal dimension to offer him. I don't have all these other things. You may have all these things, but when you come to God, you come to God just as you are. You're a soul. He came to save your soul. If you bring resources and talents and abilities, that can be destructive to you if you don't surrender it to God. You surrender what you have to God, be it small or be it great. You surrender it all to God's hands and say, Lord, whatever you have me to do. And when you do that, things are going to work out right for you. You'll look back in 10 years and say, I can't believe I come with nothing, and here I am today. Here I am today. Most people that come to God don't usually come at the height of their life. They come at the low point in their life. They come when they're wondering, when they're perplexed, when they could use help. They start looking for God's help. That's usually the way it is because otherwise they lift themselves up in vanity. So you come to God without anything. And when you come to God, you don't have anything. You realize every good and perfect gift comes down from him. It all comes from him. God has been good to me. Has he been good to anybody? God's been good to me. God's been good to me. God's been good to me. And if I had nothing in this world, if I could just hang on till payday, if I just hold on to payday, I'm going to get paid for everything I've done. If maybe you say, well, I don't feel like I, you know, I wanted to be a success, I wasn't. God's taking that into account. He's, he's keeping the books. Well, I didn't do all I wanted to do, but I did all I could. I didn't do all I wanted to do, but I did all I could. God, I commit it all to you. Let's all stand. Praise God. Praise God. We're going to have a business session, but not until we pray. Right now, we need some real, we need some you know, introspect here. We need to see, okay, God, you may have had something designed for me that's so much bigger than what I've had for myself. Okay, all right, I'm fixing to, fixing to lay a big old heavy load of bricks on all of y'all. You ready? Okay. So you think, since you're so tall and everything, that you're going to play NBA basketball. It's your desire. You're hearing the preacher tonight, but you're going to be a big basketball player. See, I know people like that. 
I know people. When I was in school, they kept badgering me to play ball. My friends, come on, smells. I could have been like them right now with old broke down raggedy knees. I see them at Home Depot and it's all wrong. And they're not playing with the NBA and they didn't become Michael Jordan or LeBron James. None of the above. <laughs> but most all of them, you sit, get that breakdown when you get to college. You start really getting the stress. You start losing those knees and football. You start losing all the stuff you wanted to do. Okay, you thought, man, I'm on it now, and then all of a sudden, it don't work out. Now you got this old gal you're living with, and they were slipping you a little money when you were in college. You know, you wasn't supposed to do that. Now they say college ball players make pretty good money. They want to start taxing them, I think. Okay, so now, well, now you got a baby on the way. She's sick, and now they release you, and you're... There's no future ahead for you, right? So all that you put all your hopes and dreams in, you had this great thing you were going to do, now it's not happening, right? You realize how devastating that is to people? Usually they become alcoholics and drug addicts because they don't know about Jesus. So here I am, I'll see my friends. One of them used to live right over there. He was big time. He was like Mr. Popular. He was the most likely to succeed. He was Mr. OHS. But he's already dead and gone. Alcoholism. See, it was very short-lived, right? Very short-lived. But when you serve God, you just keep doing it long enough. Keep doing it long enough. Keep on. When you don't understand, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. This is, maybe this is really a class for the hyphen people, the young adults. You keep doing it, always trying to better yourself and be in tune with the world around you. What do I need to be better? What do I need to be better? What do I need to be better to represent God in this world? What would God want from me? And when you do that, you fine-tune your talents, fine-tune your ability. You know where you're going. And maybe all that stuff that lured you that was a little off the track before, then you start saying, okay, this is me. You'll find out who you are, and God will start multiplying you. It doesn't matter what everybody else says about you. Can I tell you that? It doesn't matter what everybody says. says you're a loser. It don't matter. But if you know God is really communicating with you and you're, you're listening to him and he's listening to you and you feel that direction, you know what? Your life's going to have meaning to it that you could have never made it have otherwise. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek it first, young people. Raise your voice to him. Lord, help me make the right decisions. Help me do what's right. Help me make the right decisions, Lord. Help me do what's right, Lord. Help me, Lord. To glorify you and what I do. In the name of Jesus. 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 Now, we're going to have a business session. My last two minutes before nine, here's what I want to tell you. The Bible says that you can prove God by bringing your tithing to the house of God. 